Hi, Walter. How are you doing? Hey, Keith. How are you? Hopefully the speaker shows up soon. Yeah, I agree. Hi, uh, and Andy, how are you doing? Andrew? Hi, Keith. I'm, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Oh, just fine. Yeah, just uh, busy as ever, but enjoying life. Good. Yeah. I try to leave myself muted, so uh, that's why I say hey. Uh, do you have uh, are you the host of the meeting or am I? I don't I don't know if I have a... I think uh, somehow or another we both are supposed to be uh, hosting, but um, I mean on on a zoom connection, but I could never get it to work last last week. I tried to, to... okay, well, hopefully one of us can get it to work this time. Yeah. Hey, Henrietta, how are you? Hello, Walter, how are you? Let me, let me uh, start my video. I'm doing good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for agreeing to do this. Of course. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Yeah. You want to try to see if you can share your, I, I imagine you're going to use the uh, slides. So yes. Yeah. No, no, it's all just talking. Yeah, yes, it's, it's, <laughs> it's on the blackboard. And you're just gonna it's waving my place. hands. Yeah, and... exactly. Um, here we go. Let's try to see if I can share this. Um, sorry, it's thinking about showing the slides. Yeah. How's that? Looks good from here. I think we're all set. So we'll just wait a couple more minutes for people to uh, to appear, and then okay. and then uh, whenever you're ready, we'll start. Yes, and uh, thanks, uh, Henrietta. I'm Keith Baker. I'm a colleague of Walter. Thank you for agreeing to uh, give the presentation today. Hi, Keith. Thank you for the invitation. And I see David there too. Hi, Henrietta. Good to see you. You too. You might try going to view and, and do a uh, full screen or a yeah. slide. Let me try to do it. You don't have to do it right now, I think, but at the appropriate time. How does that, does that work better? Yeah. Yeah, I think it looks better. Great. Maybe we'll wait another minute or so and, and then we can get started. Okay. So I like that it's called Physics Club. Yeah, that, I hear that goes back to Gibbs. He came up with that name. I don't know if that's really true or not. Maybe somebody else knows. Well, it makes it sound very friendly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Colloquium sounds so formal and a little stiff, but 
Yeah, well, anything that involves Latin is kind of formal. <laughs> right. So how are you guys? How are things at Yale? Okay, we're in person teaching. Are you? Yes, the same. Yeah. Teaching sophomores. Oh, okay. How big a class is it? About 46 students. Oh, wow. What What's the subject? It's an honors physics, class, uh, honors physics, uh, special relativity, thermodynamics, and waves. Yeah, nice. Yeah. It's a nice combination. How can you find a room that will fit 48 distanced students? We're not distanced. We have a vaccine mandate and mask required, but yeah. we are not distant. We are in the same classroom that I used to have the class uh, pre-pandemic. Uh -huh. um, so the first time it, it just definitely feels a little crowded, but, but even walking around in the class and have them do worksheets and talk to each other, it feels, it feels totally fine. Yeah. But of course, every week we have a few kids who have to stay home and a few people who have to go get tested and so on. So right. It's part of the, part of the scenario. Yeah. Part, part of life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The new, the new normal, I guess, is what it's called. I guess that's what it is. I think we have sort of a critical mass. So, so when when you're ready, I'll introduce you. Are you you ready to go? Yep, let's go. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, another edition of Physics Club. Uh, I'm pleased today to introduce Henrietta Albang. She is the Therno Professor of Physics at the University of Michigan. Uh, Henrietta got her PhD in 2005 from the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, and then went on to do uh, a postdoctoral appointment, appointment at MIT, where she was a Papillardo Fellow, and then at, at the Institute for Advanced Study, and then she's been on the faculty at the University of Michigan since 2009. Um, she has a lot of awards, so I'm not going to sit here and read all of them, but I'll just say a few highlights, including the 2010 NSF Career Award, the 2016 uh, Maria Gopert Meyer Award from the APS, and in 2018, she was awarded an APS fellowship also from the APS. Um, Henrietta's research is in theoretical high energy physics. And uh, she has worked on broad aspects of gravity and quantum field theory, uh, things of that sort. Uh, she is well known for discovering some very interesting black hole solutions in, in string theory and in supergravity, including things called black Saturns, which are kind of mind blowing. Um, she has also done work on holography and the ads CFD correspondence and on the structure of renormalization group flows in quantum field theory. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that the focus of her research in the last several years has been on the physics and the structure of scattering amplitudes. Uh, she is a world leader in that subject. She wrote the, the textbook with uh, Huang that has now become sort of the standard reference for anybody that wants to enter the field. So all students, uh, in theoretical physics know this book well. Um, so the talk today is indeed about scattering amplitudes and I'll shut up now and uh, let Henrietta uh, talk, tell us about her work. Thank you so much for that really, really nice introduction, Walder. And thank you for the invitation to, to speak at Yale today. Uh, I would have loved to be there in person, but uh, it's, it's great to see you guys on, on Zoom. So today's talk is about uh, two main fields of subject. Uh, on the one hand, particle physics, here illustrated with a scattering picture from Atlas. And on the other hand, gravity, in particular, gravitational waves, binary in spirals, and so on. So we'll see how both come up, but let's, let me start with particle physics. So at the LHC, protons collide against protons. And that gives rise to a spray of particles, as we saw in this example here, two jets coming out. If we zoom in on it, then the protons have partons inside, 
In particular, each proton has two up quarks and a down quark. The quarks are massive spin one half fermions. The up has electric charge two thirds. The down has electric charge minus one third. So they combine to give a net plus one charge of the proton. If you look a little closer, the protons really have a sea of quarks and antiquarks and gluons inside. Uh, the gluons are massless spin one bosons. They're self-interacting. And they're what we say uh, are the force carriers of the strong force. And all that can be described in QCD, quantum chromodynamics of, of the strong force. So now when we have protons colliding, what can well happen and does happen many times is that what actually interact with each other are the partons. So here illustrated by, with two high energy gluons colliding, something happens and, and a spray of new particles come out here in, in the drawing, I made it two gluons coming out because in particular, I'll talk about gluon scattering next. So as the gluon come out as produced in the interaction, they come out at some scattering angle, they hadronize and they form jets. And here with just two jets coming out, they come out back to back, of course, to conserve momentum. And that's exactly what we see in this picture here in the tracking chamber. We see the charged particles coming out. We see how they deposit energy in the calorimeters and you get able to reconstruct the events this way. Now, what happens? We have gluons coming in and gluons going out and there can be some scattering angle in the process. The probabilities of these processes to happen as a function of incoming and outgoing particles, their energy momentum and scattering angles is encoded in the differential cross section. This quantity is basically what you try to match onto with the experimental data. Those scattering cross sections are calculated in, in theoretical physics as phase space integrals over the amplitude squared. And the amplitude is, is what we will talk more about. Amplitude is what we'll talk more about in this talk. So this is reminiscent of in quantum mechanics, how the probability is the absolute value squared of the wave function. Here we have the additional phase space integral and the amplitude is not a wave function, but a slightly different object. So an example of how you compute the scattering amplitude. Well, Feynman taught us to draw all the possible Feynman diagrams with the same, with the, with the appropriate external state to incoming glue ones, to outgoing glue ones. And then you form all the diagrams that you can following the rules of the model. And the rules of the model say that gluons can interact with the, via a cubic interaction and via a quartic interaction. And so the leading order contribution to this process is the sum of all the tree level diagrams you can draw. Those are the ones that have no internal closed loops. The loop diagrams are the quantum corrections to this process. The tree diagrams somehow capture the classical aspect of the process, the loops are the quantum corrections. And so the leading order processes are those that take place at tree level, namely only having tree level Feynman diagrams. And so we see for two gluons going to two gluons, there are five diagrams, oh, sorry, four, I should count probably, four diagrams. But when I jump ahead and I think about adding a fifth gluon, which was what I was already mentally doing in my head, you can see there are many places I can add it. I can add it at any one of the three vertices. I can add it at the internal propagator. I could add it on one of the external lines. And therefore, when I go up in number of particles, even at tree level, the number of diagrams you have to compute to get a gluon scattering amplitude at the leading order uh, goes up very, very quickly. And the number of diagrams grows very rapidly. And here I've, I've listed the numbers for, for two to three, two to four, two to five, two to six. So while the easy two to two process is typically calculated in a graduate uh, quantum field theory class with just the four diagrams and it doesn't take up that much space to write down what it is, these other processes with many diagrams are typically not the subject of any homework sets with standard Feynman diagram methods. So it becomes intractable. And again, this is just the leading order. We're not even talking about loops. Yet surprisingly, it turns out that there exist very simple results for some of these amplitudes. Now gluons are massless particles with spin one. And that means that we can characterize a gluon with its helicity. It has helicity plus or minus one, depending basically of whether the spin points in the direction that the gluon is going or in the opposite direction. And so if we look at a particular process where I take two gluons to have positive elicity going in and the rest of them that it's producing in the scattering process to also all have positive elicity, then there's an incredibly simple formula that encodes the sum of all those thousands of Feynman diagrams. 
And that's known as the Park-Taylor formula. And it's been known since the 80s, where it was practically guessed by Park and Taylor based on the low multiplicity calculations. So this spinner helicity formalism that this is written in is a very compact way of encoding the kinematics of the process. And it basically involves these angle brackets, which roughly speaking can be thought of as square roots as the products of the energy momentum vectors of each of the external particles. And then there's a complex phase, but, but anyway, that, that's just a very compact way of writing this. But the compactness of the notation is, is still not taking it away from the fact that this encodes the result. This one term encodes the result of thousands of diagrams. Um, very good. Now, up through the 90s, uh, a lot of new methods were developed to compute amplitudes, in particular with focus on getting amplitudes that are relevant for particle phenomenology. And this includes, includes the type of high energy parts on scattering with gluons and quarks, just like we talked about here. It includes productions with W and Z bosons of the weak force, Higgs, of course, uh, and many more. So one example were the baron skeele offshell recursion relations from the late 80s and 90 that could be used to actually prove the formula of Park and Taylor. And there were also a series of, of in methods that were inspired from string theory uh, by developed by Barron, Kosover, and Lance Dixon, uh, as well as what they came up with in terms of generalized unitarity, a method that is sort of like Fermi's golden rule, but for amplitudes. That those allowed, those string inspired and generalized unitarity methods allowed very easy calculation, or at least a lot easier calculation of loop amplitudes where the Feynman diagram methods have, would have made it much more complicated, if not impossible. Some of these methods use supersymmetry, a symmetry that matches up fermions and bosons to organize the calculations. And it turned out that especially one theory was a very fruitful testing lab for developing new methods. And that was the model known as N equals four super Yang Mills theory. What was nice about N equals four super Yang Mills and is nice about it is that it has a lot of symmetry. So you can develop methods there in a controlled manner and then import them into, for example, QCD and other applications. And this is certainly still being done in many, many contexts. So a question that still remained, despite all this amazing progress on calculational and more efficient techniques for calculating amplitudes, the question remained was that why are the answers for the amplitudes, this Park-Taylor formula, why can that be so simple when Feynman calculations appear to be so complicated? And some clues towards this started coming in in 2003. There, Whitten wrote a paper where he imported some of Penrose's formalism from twisters, and he conjectured a new formalism exactly for the gluon amplitudes that we had just have just discussed. Now, recently we had the annual conference in amplitudes uh, called Amplitudes, and then the year 2021 back here in August, and Svibaren was given a retrospective talk there, and he mentioned Whitten's paper from 2003 uh, as the paper landed as a meteorite sending shock waves even to this day. And so just to put in perspective, one of the things that this uh, implied was a, a new version of recursion relations for amplitudes that go under the name of BCFW. There are new other type of recursion relations called CSW. There are fancy formulas based on twisters and many, many other new interesting amplitudes methods. So at this point, what has been a very small field all of a sudden started to attract a lot of new people and generate a lot of activities. Now there were shock waves. And at that point, uh, when Witten's paper came out, there was in fact a workshop at the KITP in Santa Barbara exactly on this. And I was in grad school at UCSB, but I was busy with other things. So I felt the shock waves. I saw how all the postdocs got super excited about amplitudes and started generating many, many papers on it. Um, but I didn't catch on. I was busy, as, as Walter pointed out, I was working on black holes. Um, I, I started studying black rings and later on as a postdoc, these black Saturns uh, that he mentioned. But again, I, I sort of missed the, the shock waves. I felt the perturbations, but, but I didn't catch it. Um, I didn't catch the amplitude bug, not until 2007. So what happened in 2007? Well, there was, a, there was a couple of interesting papers that came out and one of them was quite provocative in its title. It, it was called, is N equals H supergravity ultraviolet finite? So let me just provide a little bit of background. So in conventional statement is that loop amplitudes in, in many different types of theories 
have UV divergences. That means that you have to do integrals, but these integrals are not convergent. They diverge as the energy and momentum gets very large. In theories like QED, quantum electrodynamics, and quantum chromodynamics that we've talked about, these theories are renormalizable. That means we know how to deal with these divergences. But gravity is famously non-renormalizable, which is often referred to as the problem of unifying quantum mechanics and general relativity. We don't exactly know, well, we know how to deal with these uh, UV divergences, but it results in the theory being non-predictive. So what was proposed in this paper was that perhaps with enough symmetry between bosons and fermions in, in certain models, could it be that rather than having to deal with all these divergent loop integrals, that when you added up these multitude of Feynman diagrams, that somehow all the loop divergences would cancel. That would be rather remarkable. But on the other hand, we've just seen that thousands of Feynman diagrams, even at tree level, reduced to a single compact term. So, so you know, maybe things are a lot simpler than the Feynman diagrams indicate. So this paper was motivated by a recent calculation by some of these authors and their collaborators that showed that four loop amplitudes, that, that four graviton amplitudes were UV finite, namely exactly that these cancellations did happen among diagrams up to and including three loops. One and two loops had been way, known way, way from the past, but this was a very new result. And in that calculation, they started seeing something that felt like to them as magic cancellations. And so that was what this paper was about and that generated quite a lot of interest. Um, and that was what uh, caught me on. My interest was, well, the state of the art at that point would of course perhaps to brute force and go ahead to do four loops. And, and then also ask about, well, this was four graviton amplitudes. What about five graviton amplitudes and, and higher? They would be uh, on the paper just as divergent as, as anything else. But, there's no way uh, I was a postdoc, I couldn't compete with anybody doing four loops. I had never done anything beyond two loops. Uh, I still haven't done anything beyond two loops. Um, but my interest was what do the symmetries in this model have to say about these finiteness results? And can they be used to make even further predictions? But I didn't have any tools to do this. I was new to the field. So I had to start at the bottom. And so let me try to explain some of the things that even what, what it is that we even mean when we talk about these gravity amplitudes. So let's take a step back, forget about supersymmetry and talk about what is gravity scattering and why do we care about it? Good. So what is gravity amplitudes? So just like electromagnet electromagnetism is a force that is mediated by photons, which are massless spin one. And we've talked about how QCD has gluons that are massless spin one particles. Gravity has a force carrier too, which is called gravitons, massless spin two particles. Now, unlike photons and gluons, which have been detected clearly experimentally, uh, gravitons uh, as particles have not. Of course, we know gravity exists, but as a quantized theory with uh, point-like particles like gravitons, it has not been detected. But if they exist, and, and we believe they do, they should have spin two. So now what do we mean by gravity? Well, we mean Einstein's theory of general relativity. And Famously, that is, is, of course, the dynamics of space and time governed by Einstein's equation. Now, Einstein's equation, you can get as the equation to motion from the variational principle of an action known as the Einstein-Hilbert action. And it consists of, uh, it basically encodes the dynamics of the metric. And it says that the metric, there's a square root of minus the determinant of the metric times the curvature of space time. And then overall, uh, one over 16 pi times Newton's constant. Now in units where we put C and H bar to one, uh, the Newton's constant is, is practically the same as the Planck mass. So the Planck mass is one over the square root of Newton's constant. And that comes out to be a scale about 10 to the 19 GeV. So an extremely high energy scale uh, in the particle physics units. What do we mean by perturbative gravity then? Well, if I take my metric that describes the curvature of space time, and I expand it around flat space with some small fluctuating field times a constant kappa, which is the square root of G up to some factors. Then this action um, gets a set of terms um, in, that depend on H because this is the curvature flat space has no curvature. So the starting point is something that is quadratic in this fluctuating field. Here I'm being schematic. I'm not saying how all these indices are, are placed 
but just schematically, I have a quadratic terms with two derivatives. If we vary the action with respect to this fluctuation, we end up with an equation of motion, which is really the wave equation. You have to do a certain gauge fixing and so on, but you end up with a wave equation with the physical degrees of freedom. And those are exactly the gravitational waves uh, that were famously detected by LIGO first in 2015 and announced early in 16. And of course, with the Nobel Prize being awarded to uh, Weiss, Farish, and, and Thorne in 17. Okay, so now we made contact from standard Einstein's equation and gravitational waves through this, through this action. But we're doing an expansion in small fluctuations, so there are also higher order terms in the action. What do they do? Well, in the language of quantum field theory, the leading quadratic term that describes the gravitational waves is basically just a propagator. That makes sense. This describes the propagation of a graviton. There are cubic terms then that correspond to cubic interactions among gravitons, quartic interactions from the fourth order, fifth order gives a quintic interaction, and so on. There are really infinitely many terms in this expansion. So that makes Feynman rules, uh, calculation with Feynman rules, sort of more intricate, intricate than with blue ones because there are even more diagrams that you can write down because of the higher point interactions. It makes sense that gravitons should interact with themselves. Gravitons interact with anything that has energy. That's really what, the, what we're familiar with even from Newton's formula that energy connects with energy. Mass connects to mass and mass is energy. So gravitons self-interact. What does it look like to calculate graviton scattering? Well, if I have two particles in and two particles out, just like for gluons, I have four diagrams to write down. But unlike for gluons, where each diagram corresponds to a line of math, basically one line, then for gravity, it corresponds to, each of these diagrams corresponds to about a page of indices and momenta and polarization vectors and so on, as indicated in this expression here, which came from a paper by Sanon in, in 86. So it is a rather complicated thing to calculate graviton scattering with Feynman rules. Do we even care about calculating such scattering? Well, let's, let's talk about that. So the gravitational interaction is controlled by square root of Newton's constant, but that is of course a dimension full quantity. So to get things in proper dimension less quantities, we have to multiply kappa by an energy scale. And remember that kappa is something that has the scale of about 10 to the minus, so, so then kappa becomes something of the scale of 10 to the minus 19 GeV, because square root of G was basically the Planck mass, 10 to the 19 GeV. So even for things like LHC energies, which are order 10 to the four giga electron volts, the effective coupling is extremely small, about 10 to the minus 15 in dimensionless units. And so that is one reason why we have never in, at the LHC, say, detected spin two gravitons. So do we even care about perturbative gravity? This is clearly something that seems like out of reach to possibly detect. Well, we care about it and we care about the graviton self-interactions for the following reasons. Well, tree-level scattering captures the classical physics and the classical physics is the same physics that is captured in Einstein's equations. Let's see how this works. If I have some massive particle with mass one and another one with mass two, they will interact with each other through gravity. If they exchange a single graviton, then we know from the cubic interaction that that goes with the coupling kappa, but gravity by the equivalence principle have to couple to everything with the same coupling. Everything is energy and that's what it couples to and energy is energy. So whether it's a massive a spinless particle or another graviton, it has to couple with the same coupling. So every vertex gives me kappa. And so that means that whole diagram here is worth kappa squared. But kappa is square root of g, so this whole thing gives me a g. The coupling is somehow also proportional to something that has to do with the energy of the particle here. These are static particles, so I have one with mass m1 and one with mass m2 because that's the characteristic energy of those objects. And then there's something that has to do with the distance between the objects, and that enters into r. Now, how do we get from here to there? Well, this is an amplitude, so we're in momentum space. We have to take a non-relativistic limit and then Fourier transform. And that's when you end up with this expression here, which of course is our familiar Newton gravitational potential. So very nice. One exchange graviton corresponds to the Newtonian potential. Now there are two classes of corrections to this. One is that 
the objects, the two masses could be moving. And there I could calculate corrections to the Newton formula as a non-relativistic expansion in small speed over the speed of light. Those are called post-Newtonian corrections. There are also the possibilities of calculating higher powers in G. What does that mean? It means that, if, for example, if I exchange two gravitons, then I would have something with four kappas involved, that would be four vertices. And therefore, there would be an order G squared correction to this expression for a diagram with two gravitons exchanged. And this corresponds to these powers, higher powers and G corrections correspond to what are known as post post Minkowskian corrections. Now, if you're interested in a problem like the effective description of black hole binary in spirals, then by the very old theorem, V squared is basically the same as GM over R. That is basically equation of motion. You could even see this from a circular orbit. And this is in units then. In, so, so when we are in units, where V is a, where C is one speed of light is set to one, then V is very small and therefore G is very small. And therefore the, the expansions in post-Newtonian and Minkowskian are not entirely independent. So we need both the corrections from G as well as the one from V squared. Okay, now do we care about graviton scattering? So yes, the answer is yes, because we do want to calculate things like in spirals. And in, in recent years, and actually starting uh, for me first with a paper by, by Walder and Ira Rothstein from 2004 with gravitational effective field theory for extended objects, you can actually compute effective potentials for spiral, uh, for in spirals from Feynman diagrams. And here they have an effective field theory for it. Here there's a, there's a different, slightly different setup. But this paper um, by Baron Chung, Royban, Chen, and Solon has a very nice figure that illustrates that how at the first Postman-Kowskian order, where I stay at the leading order in G, I have the expansion in small speed. And then as I go to higher orders in G, the same orders in the effective theory appear in the same column. This is from a paper where they calculated the third Postman-Kowskian order, so the order G cubed. So what does it look like? So we had our leading Newtonian potential coming out of a single graviton exchange. We mentioned that we could exchange two gravitons, but they could also have interactions, sort of this cubic interaction that we know exists in Einstein's theory of gravity. And summing up all those diagrams at order G squared gives you the, the next post minkowskian order uh, correction to the Newtonian potential. And this was calculations that were done. Um, there's several papers, but one I mentioned here is uh, from 2002. The paper I just mentioned went to the next order, free gravitons exchanged, and then this whole set of many, many other diagrams, plus many more. And that was done very recently um, for, for, and this is, this, in, this is for both moving masses, so both non-zero velocity and expansion in velocity, as well as expansion in, in, G, uh, in G at order G cubed. Now, if we then highlight what is inside the massive line, so these were the massive particles, what is inside here? What we see is exactly the graviton amplitudes that I, I showed you before. So in fact, one of the techniques that are used to calculate these diagrams are to do so-called unitarity cuts, where you put the external states inside here on show, and that gives you part of the contribution to the amplitude. Now, what we then see is that yes, indeed, we do care about graviton amplitudes because they matter for a calculational technique that can be helped to calculate the effective potential of in spiral black holes. Well, so we care about it, but let's come back to the part where it was very complicated. So we had this four point amplitude, it's the sum of four diagram, each of them is about a page of nonsense. How are we gonna even deal with that? Uh, the answer is we don't. We don't use Feynman diagrams to do this. In fact, the point of Sanon's paper from 86 was to show explicitly from the Feynman diagram calculation that when the expressions for all these four diagrams are added up, the answer turns out to be incredibly simple. The answer actually turns out to be the product of two gluon amplitudes, just like the ones I started showing you at the beginning of the talk. So here on the left, I have two to two graviton scattering. On the right, I have a product of the parts of two gluon to gluon amplitudes. And then they're simply multiplied by what we know as the Mantelstam variable S, which is really just the sum of the energy momenta and, and squared quantity that sits here. Now it turns out 
that remarkably, there are similarly expressions at tree level for higher point graviton amplitudes. They can all be expressed in terms of sums of products of gluon amplitudes. So this links the two subjects I started mentioning on the first slide, particle physics on one side, gravity on the other side, not just in spirit, not just because you can use Feynman diagrams, both of them, or you can use amplitudes, both of them, but literally it links the gravitational amplitudes to those of the gluons. Such relations that are often summarized as saying gravity equals yang mills theory squared. yang mills theory is what describes the gluons. They originally were found from string theory by Kavai and Levelin and Tai, and so they go under the name of KLG relations. And it was in fact this relation found from string theory that motivated Sanons to calculate this, to see on the field theory side that this really matched up as the way they had said. By now, there are many, many applications of this double copy. They, is, there, is there any uh, clear reason why this equation, uh, why this equality happens that gravity equals Young squared? So from, from the KLT point of view, from strings, there's a little bit of a sense of why this works. So let me try to explain. So, so gravitons in string theory are closed strings. They have no ends. And gluons are open strings. So you could loosely think about a, a graviton being made up of two open strings like this. One way it's self and said is that there are modes that go left around the string and modes that go right around the string and they made up the, the whole graviton. Now, when you calculate scattering amplitudes in string theory, uh, there are quantities that you use that are called vertex operators. And the vertex operators for gravity are exactly the product of those for Yang-Mills. It's kind of like saying that the polarization vectors are the product of each other. But what is extremely non-trivial is you have to then calculate an integral over the, all the insertions of these vertex operators in string theory. And the remarkable thing is that the factorization happens after that integral is carried out. You know, the integral of a product of functions is not necessarily a product of functions. It's just something. But the remarkable thing here is that that integral gives you a product and that's the non-trivial part of it. So, so there is a little bit of an intuition from string theory why there could be such a relation, but it's still, still quite non-trivial. Um, there's a lot more structure to this relation and, and I will tell you more about this uh, in, in this talk. So, so please feel free to also ask again uh, about it if, if, if there's still more questions about it. Um, I, I, indeed, I'll talk about how this can even possibly possibly work because it's, it's really remarkable. If you don't mind, um, maybe one quick question uh, back there. So basically, uh, I, I realize that there is a parameter, small parameter uh, V over C. Yes. Uh, and my understanding is that there is also a small parameter associated with uh, with capital G. Right. One or yeah, basically M, something like M V squared with M is mass over over G. That's right, exactly like right. this. So, so there are two small parameters and you had expansion in both as far as that Very good. So, so for the in spiral problem, you have expansion yeah. in both and they're of the same order, so both matter. Yes, yeah, so I don't understand uh, the statement that uh, there are two parameters. What does it mean that of the same order? So they're, they're both small and yeah. It means that the virial theorem sort of links them together. So I can't okay. just expand in G if I also, if I, I mean, I can, but then I have to keep B finite. If I expand in both, I have to keep both orders to be uh, okay. consistent. So, so due to the virial theorem in a, in a concrete, say, if I have exactly. yeah. such a problem where I start with, with an orbit where virial theorem is, is satisfied, well, actually, no. Okay, I'll take it back. So because of the virial theorem, this is all related. I, I yeah. Good, 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 good. So, so what, when I talk about the amplitudes now, and I talk about here, when I talk about this amplitude, for example, I'm not expanding in small b. Here I have b finite. I'm not taking a non-relativistic limit. So we're no longer expanding in the small velocity. We're no longer just thinking about the, the in-spiral problem. We're thinking completely in general about gravitons in, gravitons out. So in this problem here, no, no, there's no expansion. We're working at finite momenta and energy. But we do have a coupling dependence. And so we are thinking this in terms of a low energy theory so that my energy but that we had over here, my energy E times kappa is small. But that's easy to achieve because kappa is so small in units of GV that, that any kind of reasonable energy I would think about is, is, is going to be perturbative. So that in that sense, gravity is a good effective theory for this. And so when we write this statement here, 
gravity equals Yang Mills theory squared, so gluons squared are gravity. We're not doing any non perturbatory expansion. We're beyond the in spiral problem. We're completely general, and we can then get to the in spiral problem by doing expansions later. So, so these applications, this relation between the amplitudes as they are, have been used now in many different contexts. They can explore the UV structure of supergravity theories, which was the paper I mentioned that got me, got me hooked into the amplitude subject. There are, they can be used to gravitational radiation uh, using the work of, of Walder and Ira, as well as, of course, the, the more recent work also on free PM calculations, free post minkowskian uh, corrections. There's certain funny enhancement of symmetries that happens in these double copy relations that we're still trying to understand. There are properties of string amplitudes that also come in. People have tried generalizations to other spaces, not just flat space. These uh, relations also are valid uh, in a different version, or actually a similar version, we'll talk more about it, for chiral perturbation theory, theory, which is the low energy theory of pions. And in that case, you double copy not to gravity, but to something called Galileans, which are scalars that show up in certain cosmological models and many other contexts um, uh, in, their own, in their own way. And then also, because we have talked about this relation being a relation among amplitudes at tree level, that also motivates us to think about this as classical double copy in the context of equations of motion, because after all, the tree level was just supposed to capture the classical physics. And so is it also true, and that's people have started exploring this, uh, is it also true that classical solutions in yang Mills theory somehow in some language double copies to gravitational use solutions, and can we use that to learn more about either side? So as a side note, uh, before I tell you more about the double copy, uh, let me just bring us back to the sort of history um, with a very set of specific select point in the history of amplitudes and many others, uh, what happened. So in, back in the 60s, there was an S-matrix program of trying to understand the amplitudes and, and figure out what they were based on the analytic properties. That ended up stalling a bit, but then in, in 1986, I mentioned that we started getting these double copy relations from K, L, and T. They came from string theory, but have a, have a model in, in, in field theory a limit. Now from the mid eighties and onwards still ongoing, there were these methods to develop amplitudes that were more efficient, off-shell recursion, generalized unitarity, as I mentioned. And then Witten's meteorite paper with twister strings, I missed that bus, but I caught on once these ideas of finiteness of supergravity theories were, started coming out in 2006 and seven and the three loop finiteness uh, question at four point. So as I mentioned, the state of the art would have been to sort of say, I want to do four loops, but I would have been run over by the, uh, by the experts uh, if I had even tried it. So I had to start from the bottom. And when I finally caught on, my first paper was in fact about a new double copy tree level formula for modeling, for, for, for mapping gluon amplitudes into gravity amplitude, something that had more of the spirit of literally being something squared, being a graviton amplitude. So that was my first little entryway. Now, meanwhile, things moved on. There were new formulas for double copy that was derived by BC and J, uh, Baron Johansson and Carrasco. Uh, and they, they have been very influential in, in launching the field of double copy for amplitudes into new, uh, new states. Now, then in 2009, so a few years after the free loop result, the collaborators, Baron and, and friends, they, they showed that at four loop, the four graviton amplitude was also finite. But shortly after that, uh, I, could, I was able to have enough tools to come back with my collaborators to show what the impact of symmetries were on this question of UV finiteness. And without having to calculate any loops, we were able to show just based on the symmetries that are known in this model of N equals eight supergravity, that no UV divergences could possibly occur until at the earliest seven loop order. It took quite a while before five loops were shown to be finite. It was actually quite expected to be finite at four point, but none trivial nonetheless. And still there's no, there's no six loop result, but we know that the answer will be finite in four dimensions. And now I want to bring you up to, to speed on some of the, the more modern thinking we have about this double copy which is something uh, we call the double copy bootstrap uh, based on a paper with a postdoc here in Michigan, Juan Heng Chi, my graduate students, uh, Aidan Hedersky 
and recently graduated Callum Jones and, and Shruti Paranchipi. And so that is what the, the next part will be out. But I wanted to bring back to the part about the, the sort of historical way of I ended up in, in this field. Okay, so the double copy, how can it possibly work? So the amplitudes that go into the double copy uh, are, are a particular kind. So in gluons, they carry a certain charge, of which is a color charge, but gravitons do not have this. So somehow that has to come off. And the way it comes off is that you decompose the gluon amplitude in a way that takes the group theory part away. That's what has sort of this color structure and you leave the kinematics part. So all this is generators from a symmetry group. They can sit inside a single trace at three level. And so you're left with this part, which is the kinematics. And that kinematics knows something about the cyclic ordering. So there's a meaning to the ordering of the states. And if I was thinking in terms of Feynman diagrams, that ordering of the states that sit in this kinematic factor, which is called the color ordered amplitude, that implies on the Feynman rules that I only consider diagrams where no lines cross and I preserve the overall ordering that is listed here. So the amplitude with one, two, three, four ordering has the cyclic one, two, three, four listed. And I draw only the diagrams that have no legs crossing. And so that means instead of five, four diagrams, I just have three at, for this one, two, three, four. If I interchange four and three, it's the same looking diagrams, but now the labels for four and three have been interchanged and that affects what the mathematical expressions are. In particular, for every one internal line I have, I will have a propagator, and that results in a mathematical aspect of this amplitude and having a simple pole. So when I have one, two being the lines outside, that simple pole is in the Mandelstam parameter we call S, and that S is encoded in one, two. If I have a one, four that goes into that internal line, then it would be the U because that relies on one and four. Uh, and this contact diagram that doesn't have any poles. So it's just a, something low, no, no divergences in that. Similarly for this other one, there's an S pole and then there's a T pole because now it's one and three that comes in. Okay, so I have these three parameters, S, T and U. They're not independent, but some of them must add up to zero for this type of amplitude. But nonetheless, the statement is that the amplitudes individually have certain poles. And that means that the product of them will have a pole in S and T and U, but the else a pole is necessarily a double pole because you multiply these two diagrams together and you get a one over S squared. Now that's no good because the graviton amplitude has only simple poles and it must only have simple poles and they have an, an S and T and U. So the only way a double copy could possibly work that would multiply these two guys together and give a graviton amplitude is if that double pole in S is canceled. And that's exactly what the double copy formula does. It had a factor of S right out in front. So here I've written the formula that I showed you before. It has the ordering one, two, three, four for blue ones multiplied by one, two, four, three. And that S factor that sits out in front is part of what we call the multiplication kernel for the double copy. And that takes care of that uh, unwanted double pole. Now, there are many ways of writing the double copy. I could also have multiplied the same amplitude with itself. But remember that that amplitude had poles in S as well as in U. And so now when I multiply them together, I get double poles both in S and U. But the kernel is smart. It has zeros in S and U that take care of those double poles. Another problem with this product was that it didn't have any T pole, but the kernel takes care of that problem by including that T pole and the fact that this actually works to produce the correct graviton amplitude seems like a bit of a miracle. It's not just that the pole structure work out, that's, that's a miracle in itself, but the fact that it also gives the right factorization into free particle amplitudes is extremely non-trivial. So this works at four point, but it also works at, at end points. And these two relations that are written here are examples of these KLT relations. So just to emphasize, the double copy kernel plays a role of eliminating unwanted double poles from the product of amplitudes in the gluon sector, and it provides the missing poles that such a product might have had, might, might have been missing. Now there's another important aspect of the field theory KLC relations, and that is I showed you two different formulas, but there's only one graviton amplitude, so these two necessarily have to be the same thing. 
That means the difference of these two expressions must be zero. We can factor off the common factor of the one, two, three, four ordering. And we're left with a particular relation that the two other amplitudes must have. And that happens to be true exactly for amplitudes in yang mills theory. And that is an example of what is now known as a BCJ relation at four point. Uh, if I had chosen other orderings of the states, I would have ended up with other relations known collectively at the kleist cruyff ECJ relations, KKBCJ relations. They're just sort of trace reversal symmetries. There's something called the U1 decoupling identity, and then that one BCJ relation that I, that I mentioned. So the upshot of this is that there exists a double copy that produces uh, from color order, products of color ordered amplitudes, uh, it produces amplitudes of another theory, all of this as a tree level, for example, from gluons to gravitons. Not all theories can be double copied. In order for this double copy to make sense, it must be that all these different ways of multiplying the amplitudes together give the same answer. And that is what is ensured by this KKPCJ set of relations. So which theories we could ask satisfy such relations? Well, I told you yeah, Yang Mills theory, the theory that describes the gluons, it does, it gets a check mark. If I try to do any supersymmetric versions of this, it still satisfies these relations, so check mark there. The low energy effective theory that describes pions is chiral perturbation theory that also happens to satisfy these relations. And then there's a funny theory that I know Walder has worked on in the past. This is called the biadjoint scalar model, and we'll hear a little bit more about that as we go. And Ria, do you mind if yes. I ask a question of about course. the previous slide? Um, yeah. So when you say that chiral perturbation theory works, are you referring to just the leading and derivatives term or, or yes. are there yes. higher order, higher dimensional structures that work? I, I'm just talking about the leading and derivative terms, the, the, the two derivative terms uh, when I mentioned chiral perturbation theory, but of course they're higher order terms. And for each one of those higher order terms, one should go and check if they satisfy the relation. And that provides a selection principle for which one of those higher order terms can do that. Okay. And, and some pass and some don't. Okay, thank you. Um, but in fact, one of the motivations of our recent work is to broaden the sense in which operators pass because we generalize the KKBCJ relations so that it becomes more suitable for higher derivative terms with arbitrary Wilson coefficients. Great, okay. So when you have a multiplication rule that map, maps objects, products of objects into another one, you can write these multiplication tables that I remember doing endless work, work on as, a, as an undergraduate in my algebra classes. So we have that Yang-Mills theory times Yang-Mills theory gives us gravity. We have that supersymmetric versions of this, well, actually N equals four supersymmetry, which is this lab for developing new methods, that double copy with itself to give N equals eight supergravity, which was exactly this model that was proposed to be UV finite. Then you could double copy the pion theory with Yang Mills that gives a born infeld model, which was proposed very, very early in the life of quantum field theory as a way, as a proposed but failed way to solve this electron self energy problem. You could put supersymmetry into that, that gives you something called N equals four super DBI, direct bone infield. And that is the low energy effective action on the free brains and string theory. We mentioned that pions times pions give Galileans. In fact, they give something called special Galileans that are interested to some people in, in terms of effective brain actions, massive gravity, various model buildings in phenomenology and cosmology. And then in the last row and column here, there was this funny cubic by adjoint scalar model. And that model is exactly what we would call an identity element for multiplication rule. Whatever I multiply by adjoint scalar theory with, with this KLT kernel, gives me that model back. And that's what is illustrated in these two columns and rows. So this funny multiplication map that is implied by the double copy has an identity element. And in fact, we could summarize that it's an identity element by writing down a KLT algebra. And it does exactly what an identity should do, multiplied into itself, it gives itself, multiplied into anything else from the left or the right, it gives that thing back. So what is- Just for a second. Yes. I'm, I'm still mesmerized by this uh, double copy relation. So uh, basically you, you have two uh, actions uh, for two different fields. Yes. Uh, right. Um, and then, as far as I understand, you compare somehow propagators calculated in, in, in one uh, for one Lagrangian or uh, action and for another. Yes. So, so in general, product of two uh, of two green functions has just more 
uh, more ants, more corn. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. I see what you. Yeah. So, first so, of all, I mean, you should somehow tell you know that you do something to the coordinates so that you have one to one correspondence. Right. So so um, great. So if you think about Green's functions, you would have them in position space, and you seem to get too many positions out of multiplying two of them together. So what we're doing here, we're, we're first of all we're in momentum space. And we match the momentum so that, I mean, of course we can do that with green functions too, because so we match the momentum so that what we call particle one has momentum one for both products. So they have the same momentum on the two sides. But then in addition to that, if they're, if they're gluons, they also have polarizations. And then what this relation is basically utilizing is that the product of two gluon polarizations is a graviton polarizations. A polarization. So if something is a positive helicity gluon with a positive helicity gluon, that gives me a possible helicity graviton. The same for negative helicities. Of course, I could also mismatch them. If I have positive and negative helicities mismatched, I get something that is a scalar. And that's actually why there's a little plus on the gravity here, because I don't get just gravity. I have a product of two states with two states that gives me four states. And that means I get the two states of the helicities of the graviton but I also get two scalars and those scalars are a diloton and an axion. And that is, that is what lies inside the, the meaning of this little plus that sits here. Does that help a little bit? A little bit, uh, but, but still. So, so but, um, you have more coordinates and you, yes. so in momentum space, I, I'm fine with that. So, but you Great. can take them apart in the yes. product of the two fields. In, yes. uh, so, and the subjects, do, do they have any, any meaning or is it just meaningless uh, and I shouldn't just think about them? So, no, so, so, the, so the result of the product, so the product by itself, yeah. um, if, I, if I just look at what the quantity is without the extra kernel factors, that's not meaningful. I cannot interpret that as an amplitude because it has double poles. It doesn't make yeah. sense. Right. But with this kernel, it's exactly what I would get from calculating the graviton amplitude from the einstein hilbert action. Yeah, you, you, you already told this. Thing. Right, right. Yeah. So, so that, is, that, is, that is, I think, one of the things that is surprising about it. Mm -hmm. um, and there is no any kind of symmetry underpinning uh, uh, for, for that. Uh, the, there is there's no. Um, so, so you could try to ask if you could derive the graviton amplitude from a Lagrangian where you somehow gauge fix and do field redefinitions in order to get something that really looks like that product. So that has been explored a little bit. Um, it typically requires either that you make the action non-local or that you, uh, I mean, so, so of course it will give to local result, but you do some weird field redefinitions on it or you include auxiliary fields to get there. So, so basically there is no way to, Establish some kind of a parity relation between the between the gravi uh, gravitation field and and capital F tensor or whatever is in uh, in Young Mills theory. So no, so we cannot say that the F squared of Young Mills theory squared is R. The, yeah, the not... I'm, asking, I'm asking that you know in a completely dissimilar problem in one dimensional non radiatic quantum mechanics, you can bosonize fermions in some way. Yes, right. And it's a very nonlinear transformation, but still there is a relation on the operator level. Right. So it, it's nothing like that. Here, so. so, so no, so I mean, in fact, there was a, one of the early things I tried to is, is to try to think about at the level of Lagrangians yeah. to try to do such a map. Um, and there has been work on that, but it, but it hasn't been very uh, physically illuminating, I would say. <laughs> okay. so, so, so there are various ways you could imagine this. It's a metric is a product of field binds. Uh, Warren Siegel wrote a paper where he tried to use the field binds expressions to try to get the double copy out. Um, there, there's, been, there's been the work with auxiliary fields that try to get the KLT form out of the amplitudes, but, but it's complicated. And, and I think one of the reasons it's complicated that the level of the Lagrangian is that, is that we are introducing a redundancy both on the gravity side and yes. on, the, on the field side, right? And, and that needs to be gauge fixed and it starts ending up being, being rather complicated mm -hmm. when you try to do it at that level. But at this on shelf, at the level of the physical observables, it, it works out very well. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. I'm sorry to, to take your time with this. Oh, no, it's okay. That's okay. Great. It's actually great to have questions. So, so let, me just, let me just mention what it is that we've done in recent work with this double copy. So, so the double copy at higher point than four point, it looks like a product of left amplitudes times right amplitudes, like we did in that multiplication table. And then there's a double copy kernel. 
And you sum over various color orderings of the string. And so we could summarize this as, as this kind of algebra. Uh, and we want to understand this algebra better. So what it turns out to be is that we can use this principle of the algebra to generalize what it means to have a double copy. Basically, if I look at this equation that says very trivial that one equals one times one, it is sort of intuitively clear that if I wanted to change what my kernel was, if I wanted to change what the multiplication rule is here, I will also change the identity element. And so the identity element and the kernel are intimately linked with each other. In fact, they're uniquely linked to each other. So that means that the one equals one times one, very, very trivial statement, basically becomes a bootstrap equation for generalizing the KLT kernel. Then once we have generalized the kernel, by, by modifying basically what this by adjoint scalar model is, we get a new kernel. When we have a new multiplication rule and a new identity, then these relations become generalized versions of these KKBCJ relations, uh, the relations that determine which theories can be used as input for the double copy, what makes sense there. And so this gives a new, more algebraic picture of what it means to have a double copy and which theories are allowed to be double copied. And so, for example, when, when Walder asked if I was set chiral perturbation theory, do I just mean the leading order term? That, that's true, but I can add these higher derivative corrections with arbitrary coefficients. And when I do that, so basically I'm Taylor expanding this side, so to speak, in a momentum expansion, and same for the right side, then it makes sense that I should also include a general kernel that is a Taylor expansion and higher derivative corrections to the bi adjoint scalar model. And that's exactly what we can solve for. And which higher derivative corrections are allowed in the bi adjoint scalar model are defined by solving this bootstrap equation. And then which models are allowed to be used on the left and the right are determined by these two other algebraic relations. And we can do this extremely explicitly. So what this does is that it really opens up a door for studies of effective field theories and, and the double copy relations and understanding on the space of all these possible quantum field theories, which theories get linked by these double copies and, and which ones uh, do not. So this could be much more a picture for that. So this, this is the content of the paper that we wrote this summer. And, and here are, are my collaborators, Aiden, Juan Hang, Srudi, and, and Callum. Okay, so, so a new framework for doing these things. In particular, we can enlarge the class of chiral perturbation theory, higher derivative corrections that can participate in the double copy. And of course, a, an interesting question is what does what is the selection principle mean in, in terms of the physics? So to summarize what, what I have talked about here, uh, we started out in particle physics with parts on scattering, gluons scattering to gluons, creating showers of particles. And we then went on from that high energy collisions to Postman-Kafskian corrections to, to the binary in spiral effective Hamiltonian. And we understood that to understand that problem, we certainly have to care about graviton self-interactions, which means that the calculation of graviton scattering in itself is a physically relevant problem. We then learned that while that is a very complicated thing to do in Feynman diagrams, it's remarkably simple at three level because of these double copy relations. And then in the new work we have, we have a new bootstrap formalism for these kind of, of double copies uh, that we're starting to explore more. So field theory is an enormously rich uh, area of physics. There are so many theories that live in here. Some of them are connected to each other through the double copy, and it gives a very different way of sliding theory space. Some theories are conformally invariant, such as n equals four superyang mills, and that lies in the class of of conformal theories that can be studied with the conformal bootstrap that David Poland has uh, done some pioneering work on. And so it, this is a very different way because this doesn't involve one theory that is conformally invariant, but it invo involves many other theories like super, -yang, super gravity that is non-renormalizable, gravity that's non-renormalizable, yang mills sphere that's relevant for nature, von Enfeld, and, and super DBI, which is relevant in string theory. And these bi and scalar theories, which are really weird in the sense that they're not even uh, bounded from below in energy. So, so it really maps the space of field theory in a completely different way that, that we're used to. And with that, I, I want to thank you for um, taking this hike with me um, into the land of amplitude squared and particle physics and, and in gravity. So thank you. Okay, hey, uh, let's all thank uh, Henrietta for that uh, very, very clear talk. Um,
You, you have a, a time constraint, I understand, Henrietta. Uh, yeah, I have to pick up kids, but I got I got 15 minutes, um, so I'm, I can be around and talk. Yeah, so there's time for a few questions. So please raise your hand. So if you, if you have another question, if you have a question. Uh, yeah, Meg Chen. Hey, so uh, very nice talk, thanks. And I have a quick question about the double copy relation. So do they work at tree, only at tree level or they actually extend to loop as well? So, so the KLT relations with this kernel structure works at tree level. Um, there have been some attempts to generalize, um, but, but it's, everything I said today was at, was at tree level. Um, okay. The other formalism that came out in 2008 by Van Caresco and Johansson, that also works uh, at loop level, but not for the loop amplitude, but for the integrand. Now, when I say work, it's been it's been proposed um, and it's been tested in, in multiple multiple different different contexts. Um, the the interesting part of the course, like if if I have a loop amplitude and with a full loop integral, even at one loop, and I multiply it with another one, I would double the number of loops, and so I wouldn't get another one loop amplitude. But when you nicely work at the level of the integrand. There's a certain way of doubling that, which is not just multiplying the integrands together, but to write the integrand in a particular way, and then removing a color factor from the gluon asp from the gluon amplitudes and replacing it with a kinematic factor from the other one. So you're not just multiplying things together, but that's that's the way it works. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. There are other questions. Well, maybe I'll ask one last one then. Um, so, what about uh, this issue? So, you mentioned, of course, that one of your interests is in applying this to binary in spirals. So, what about this issue of removing uh, the extra modes when you square Yang Mills, dilatons and axions? Uh, that's yes. one thing. That's so, one thing. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. Why don't you give me <laughs> no, your I, mean, take I, on I was that. gonna say that that's one thing that that you you have worked more directly with that, than I have um, in in your work. But but yes, it's it's definitely uh, an an aspect that that shows up in many different contexts because because you don't just get gravity, right? I mean, so when I when I double copy, um, then in in gravity, say with with higher, if I do if I take the Young Mills theory with an f cubed Hayek derivative correction, that can easily happen. And I multiply the amplitudes together in the double copy at four point. I start seeing exchange channels that involve the dilaton and the axion. And, and there's just no way around it. it. It's what the double copy gives me. And so I guess the key question for using these in N-spiral, both, both in the way you have done and, and the way that, that others are doing it now is to try to find a way to get rid of that so that they decouple. Um, you know, I, I, in, in what I have done on this, we have expanded up to higher, higher orders, and I can always identify the pole terms that correspond to this. They're sort of easy to spot. Mm -hmm. And if you're just thinking of this, not as in some fundamental principle of how the double copy works, but it's a practical way. This is an amplitude I want to get. This is the counter term I want to get. You just remove it by hand, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. But, uh, but I think from a, from a fundamental principle, it, it has to be there because two states times two states gives four states. There's just no way around that, no matter yes. how I write my kernel or anything else. Yeah. No, I guess that what I'm wondering about is that the calculations that have been done on the amplitude side in recent years have, have not yet involved external radiation modes. Right, right. So somehow they've been able to do this sort of thing of removing the poles uh, fairly efficiently, right? Uh, yes. For when they have, when they have just potentials like like what you showed the diagrams you showed, and so that's what I'm wondering about when you actually have the radiation itself. When you look at diagrams with external radiation, yes, yes. Is, is there a, do you think there's a simple procedure or? I guess it's a big I mean, question. I, I, so I think, I think it's, if it, I think it's for if it's a it's a concrete thing and you have 15 different amplitudes where you need to move it for, you can look at it, just eyeball it and pick out the things that you don't want. I think that's possible. But if it gets to high orders, right? If we, if we want to keep doing this to fifth post-Minkowskian order, 
at some point there needs to be an automated approach to do this. Yes. And and that that would be harder. I mean, once it's done, we, we can't get rid of the fact that that the diagrams will, will multiply to very high orders, even in this context. I, I think at 3 p.m. Um, the way they got the integrants was to do the do the double copy at a very simple level of, of just multiplying things together and they could just project things out that yeah. they didn't want. You never yeah. you never really ended up with so yeah. I mean so 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 that is easy because it's a it's a it's a simple number of, of terms to do. But I don't know, I wouldn't know how to automate it or do a fundamental principle of putting in a projection operator that just removed it. Yes. That I don't know how to do. Yep. That makes two of us. Um <laughs> I don't see any more hands up, so um, let's all once again thank Henrietta for the for that really nice talk. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thanks.